Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is lecture number 13. My guest today is Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Fine. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me here. And thank to the audience for listening. So this is lecture number 13, the seven endocrine glands and the superior senses. Well, in lecture number 11, we talked about the three brains. In lecture number 12, we, we talked about the three minds. Now we're going to talk about the seven endocrine glands and the superior senses. It really seems like these lectures are developing into a fairly complete understanding of how the human mechanism works. Yes, that, that's correct. You know, basically, we're talking here about a new biology and a new psychology because there is a strong connection between biology and psychology, even if many people cannot see it. How certain glands within our own organism can invoke the development of superior senses, but we'll be talking about that slowly, slowly. We don't want to confuse people. What are the seven endocrine glands? And how does that relate to the superior senses? You know, uh, first we should try to describe the meaning of the word endocrinology. It is a branch of biology and also medicine dealing with the endocrine system. It's diseases, you know, illness, all kinds of illnesses connected with the endocrine system and also the connection with the so-called hormones, the, so the hormones connected with those endocrine glands, when they secrete, they secrete certain energies and substances. So this is something that has to be explained more clearly because even scientists have advanced a lot within endocrinology and, and the seven endocrine glands. There is still a lot of confusion According to Gnostic anthropology, the seven endocrine glands are the pineal gland, which is allocated on the crown of our head. What scientists don't know, or, they, or maybe they do, but they don't want to say it because it needs to be verified, the pineal gland is connected with our genitals, with our own sexuality. People, you know, who get old, who are we could say, who are not already sexually active is connected with the pineal gland. The pineal gland has entered into a stage of complete degeneration. Now, the second endocrine gland is the pituitary gland allocated on the, you know, what we can call it the third eye in between the eyebrows and many people call it the third eye and you know, this is also, uh, we are going to be explaining later the connection between this endocrine system and the superior senses that we all have. Number three is the thyroids. The thyroid is allocated in our throat. Then number four is our heart. Many people don't know that the heart is also part of the endocrine system. They are convinced that the heart is just a muscle to pump blood into the system, like a motor, and this is it. But it's much more than that. Number five, the thymus gland, allocated in our lungs, with a tremendous influence in the behavior, biolo biological conduct of our lungs. Number six is our pancreas, allocated in our solar plexus. Number seven, our genitals. In, in the male human organism, we can say the prostate and the female, the uterus. So these are physical parts of the human anatomy that every doctor will know about. They, we know the location of them. We know some of the functionality in allopathic medicine, even though I'm not a doctor and neither are you, just as a disclaimer. Even though we have in our physical body all of these, there's also something related to these in other dimensions. And it, by that I mean the fourth dimension, the which is the, the vital, the astral 
mental, causal dimension, and all of the other dimensions, these same organs have other powers and abilities, don't they? That's correct. That's correct, Rick. There is a strong connection between the seven endocrine glands and the seven chakras of yoga, Hindu yoga, and also Tibetan yoga. The seven chakras are not really in the physical body, in the cellular body. The seven chakras really are connected with, remember we mentioned in past lectures, the seven bodies. We do have more than one body other than the physical body. We have an astral body, which is the molecular body, and that astral body made of molecules is the one that is connected with the seven chakras. And these seven chakras also correspond to the seven endocrine glands. There is a strong connection, invisible, of course, to the human eye, and scientists don't have the instruments yet developed to perceive those seven chakras. We can see today the seven endocrine glands through the microscope, but the seven chakras, you know, are connected with Hindu religion and Hindu philosophy, ancient philosophy, and also the ancient Chinese. It's important to try to understand that we are entering into a different kind of perception of the scientific field and its interrelationship with religion, philosophy, ancient knowledge coming from ancient times. Uh, this is why it's very, very important if we want to contribute to the well-being of humanity. Samael Onveor, the founder of Gnostic Anthropology Worldwide, he has recommended, and we do the same thing, we support Samael Onveor 100%, we do respectfully recommend the scientific community to study yoga, to study the seven chakras, to study the meaning of Kundalini Yoga. There are books about Kundalini Yoga that explain clearly what's, what is all of that, you know, the connection within our endocrine system, within the seven chakras of yoga, which are also magnetic centers connected with not only intellectual activities, but also emotional, instinctive activities, and also sexual activities. What about the seven churches of the apocalypse? They are in the Bible, you know, we mentioned that before. But number seven is everywhere. Number seven is a cosmic law. If, if you study Kabbalah and the ancient Egyptian Tarot, we will discover that number seven is the law of organization of the universe. Based on what? Based on the seven musical notes. So the universe had been created through mathematics and music. You know, it's very, very important to understand that. The trouble is our scientific community, you know, smiles and also makes fun of ideas like this because in reality, they don't know much about yoga. They have no respect for those ancient cultures. And of course, you know, they don't find the connection between science and religion. But there is a strong connection. And a man like Albert Einstein called, you know, the man of the millennium. He was a, a religious individual and he was also an amazing scientist. He said, science without religion lames. Religion without science is blind. We do agree with Mr. Albert Einstein 100%. He's right. So we need to put them together. And if you're a true scientist and you're doing research, you should never deny any possibility to explore the unknown. If you do it, it means that you're selfish, arrogant, you believe you know it all when you don't. And of course, we recommend respectfully again to the scientific community to approach this new kind of perception about reality. We're all searching for the truth. If you are also in love with knowledge, and so we are, Let's see how can we help each other. So, Jim, what is the connection with the superior senses? Yeah, this is something also very important to be described. There are opposite forces in the world 
already described in past lectures, materialistic scientists who refuse to accept any new idea coming from a religious angle, we, let's don't say a religious, let's say a mystical angle, totally unknown for the official materialistic science. And also we have the other extreme, those uh, fanatic religious individuals, many of them in a position of power within the different churches, different religions. And those people would never accept that we all have superior senses that are waiting to be awakened. It's a gift from above, a gift from the universe, a gift from Mother Nature to all of us, because we've been designed really to have more than five senses. You see, and this is very important to be understood because fanatic religious individuals, they say it is evil to think, to think that we can develop ourselves and to transform into higher beings to accept that there is a superman or a superwoman sleeping within ourselves. And on the other side, a materialistic approach into science, an atheist perception will, you know, have a tremendous coincidence with this kind of approach. They don't accept either that we can have superior senses. So now this is why we are in the middle where we are trying to marry science and religion. And we will also include there, you know, philosophy and also art, because we are all designed to become scientists, philosophers, artists, and also mystical individuals, you know. We are made of spirit and matter, both, you know, both are part of reality. So we are trying to be realistic here. The common senses, the five common senses, are connected also with the perception of a three-dimensional reality. And Albert Einstein discovered the fourth dimension, and he also opened the door for superior dimension, the fifth dimension, the sixth dimension, and the seventh dimension. And the scientific world is already moving into that. We are discovering the hyperspace a concept very much developed in astronomy and also the exploration of the universe, you know, the possibility of traveling to other planets to travel within the universe in the near future. So the hyperspace is more real than the three dimensions. And this is the problem. Our five senses are so limited to perceive reality. Many people, you know, didn't accept in the past that there are microorganisms that can create all kind of problems within our, our system until we develop the technology, we develop the instrument to see those microorganisms. And those microorganisms can be very lethal, you know, a virus can kill us. But there are also friendly bacteria. So people deny that until we had the possibility of watching them, seeing them clearly. Well, you know, this is the situation. The superior senses are something that is being kept very quiet. And why? Why? Well, there are many reasons for that, you know. People who are in a position of power and they have discovered the same, they don't want to share with the world this kind of knowledge. Because we have a tremendous respect for the truth. And we're also searching for the truth. We are searching for the reality and also the inner reality of all realities. Our duty is to explore those possibilities and to share them, you know, with the entire human race. This is why when we study again the seven endocrine glands, the pineal gland allocated in the crown of the head, and as we said, it's connected with our genitals, connected with our sexual life. Well, the pineal gland is connected with inspiration. It's a superior sense, inspiration. And also creative willpower. What is that? What's inspiration? Isn't it the capability to inhale, inhale from the universe knowledge? You know, normally geniuses have recognized that they became inspired when they discovered something new. 
something new within the scientific world? Albert Einstein described inspiration very much. He said he was inspired when he discovered the reality of relativity of time and space. What about creative willpower? Creative willpower, you know, is opposite to bad will. Most of people, most of people, you know, have bad will. You know, people are stubborn and arrogant and, of course, wrong. Creative willpower means a determination to explore reality and to find the truth no matter what. It's a creative force that we all have it within ourselves. When the pineal gland is atrophied, we don't have willpower. <laughs> we are weak. Normally, leaders, instead of followers, leaders develop that creative willpower. Leaders don't follow anybody. You know, they follow their inner genius within. As we said, the superman, superwoman within. We have a superior, you know, a superior kind of energies, you know, within ourselves and also outside of ourselves. The majesty of the universe, you know, teaches us so much. So inspiration again is inhaling, inhaling knowledge. But to get there, listen to this carefully, to get there, we have to learn to shut up. Part of the brain, which is the capability of thinking. Because when we are thinking, we go in circles. It means that it's the struggle of the antithesis. Yes, 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 against no, no, no. And at the end, what is the resolution? Maybe, maybe means nothing. So thinking will never allow us to develop new ideas, new perception of reality, because it's like a, a vicious circle. And this is the, the big tragedy of our actual humanity that doesn't want to accept that inspiration is very much needed to be developed because it's there. It's a waiting for us to be awakened. So as we said, through meditation techniques, learning to shut up the capability of thinking, we can awaken our inspiration. Remember that many people who teach meditation techniques, they say the higher way of thinking is to stop thinking. Now, the pituitary gland in the middle of our eyebrows, called the third eye, is connected with creative imagination. What's creative imagination? It's the opposite of mechanical imagination. What is that? Creative imagination is being able to perceive reality in a realistic manner without being there. So, some people call it clairvoyance. It's the same thing, creative imagination. What's the difference with mechanical imagination? Well, we all have mechanical imagination, controlled by the ego, controlled by our subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious. It means we are sleeping 24 hours a day. So that mechanical imagination is a photocopy machine. Everybody's copying everybody. You know, a movie comes into the market. Ten more movies will come with the same idea, you know. People are copying because they find, they believe it's good to do that. And they don't realize that they are becoming boring, you know, and incomplete in their perception of reality. Trying to sell a product, a movie, and at the end, you know, people get frustrated because they have seen the same ideas or concepts already there. So they don't need to be repeated the same, you know, idea over and over again. So we all have that mechanical imagination, which is no big deal. What we need to develop as a superior sense is our creative imagination. And how can we develop that creative imagination? Again, again, learning to quiet the mind. I'm sorry, learning to quiet the inferior mind, the capability of thinking, learning to shut up our perception of reality through, you know, thinking. And when we are totally quiet, silent, when the mind is silent and we close our eyes, we'll be able to visualize a reality that we cannot experience before our eyes because it transcends our eyes. Albert Einstein said, 
whatever we can imagine, whatever we can imagine within the universe is real, either within the three-dimensional universe or within the parallel universes. Everything is real. Everything is part of a cosmic mind, of a cosmic perception of reality. We are all connected. That creative imagination is a power, it's a superior sense that we all have it, but it is not developed. Later we will try to explain how can we develop, you know, better and better all these superior senses. Now, the third, number three, endocrine gland, the thyroids, are located in our throat. You know, scientists are beginning to discover there is a connection with our ears, but it's not the physical ear, it's the inner ear, which is also connected with the astral body. The astral body is our molecular nature within ourselves. And you know, this gland, this endocrine gland called thyroids, is, as we said, connected with the inner ear, and is the ear of the musicians, composers, if you talk to any composer, where did they get that perception of that specific music? They said, I can hear it. Nobody can hear it, but they can hear it. And they write it down. When geniuses like Beethoven or Mozart were questioning the past, how was it possible that they could create such a magnificent musical piece? The answer was, well, that music is everywhere. But how can you listen to it? They said, well, we just pay attention. And that music is coming from the air. It's coming from the universe. It's coming from the water, from the river, from the ocean. There are sounds. But those sounds, if you put them together, amplified, they become music. And this is interesting because in ancient schools of esoteric knowledge, they've been talking, they've been talking about the music of the spheres. And how do, do you explain that? You know, the universe has been created through mathematics and music. You know, when the planets are moving within the universe, why are they moving? Why? They are dancing, you know, within space and time. What provokes that movement? Well, the answer is sound, sound. There is a sound that we cannot perceive. Why? Because we are atrophied in that capability. Our inner ear is not developed. But if you have it developed, you'll be able to listen to that majestic sound that when it is organized, we can call it music. And Beethoven and Mozart were capable of listening to that music, and they wrote it down. That majestic symphony that came from everywhere was given to us. It was a little piece of heaven given to us. You see, and our common composers in our modern times, well, they, maybe they are not as geniuses as the way Beethoven and Mozart used to be, but they have a, a tiny little capability more developed than average people. Later, we will try to explain how can we develop that better and better. What about our heart, number four, endocrine gland number four, our heart? As we said, people believe it's just a muscle, but they don't accept that it is an endocrine gland, part of the endocrine system. If we could really observe the movement of the heart, the heart has two sides, a left and a right side, and the blood is being moved through these pulsations of the heart. You see, when we say we cannot hear to the music or the sound that moves not only the planet, but also moves our particles, our atomic particles are dancing. Did you know that? Our blood system is a magnificent expression of that movement of the universe, dancing within ourselves. And the heart contributes to do that. Part of the, the Blood is moving in one direction and the other side is moving it in the opposite direction to touch the entire organism. It's not magnificent, but the heart at the same time carries in the left side that divine 
atomic particle called knows by many schools of esoteric knowledge. Knows is also our intimus, our divine real being, God within. We could say the inner Christ that is being carried by the divine mother of the universe. In all religions speak about that. Well, so the heart is connected with the superior sense called intuition. What's intuition? Isn't it the voice of our real being talking to us? Without thinking, you know, is direct knowledge without thinking. And this is the situation. If we can awaken our intuition, we don't need to think because thinking is actually the lowest of the lowest within the intellect. And intuition is an emotional perception of reality. It's emotional language. It's a superior emotional perception of reality. It's a feeling. It's not a thought. Okay? So most of people should learn to feel life instead of thinking life. You know, this is a universe that has to be explored. The emotional universe. It's called also the astral universe. What about now? Endocrine gland number five, the thymus gland. Thymus gland, allocated in our lungs. You know, we have two lungs, same situation. We have a, a right lung and a left lung, and both are also connected with incredible, amazing perceptions of reality. According to Gnostic anthropology, the thymus gland is a superior sense that will allow us to experience the memory of our past lives. This is the trouble that many religions don't accept, that we live here before. And also the scientific community, they make fun of it, of that possibility. Okay, if we don't accept that possibility, what about genetic memory? The genetic memory of our ancestors that was transferred to us. So in our genes, is recorded what our ancestors used to be. And we're a little piece of those ancestors that came to life in this particular moment. So let's accept that possibility. So don't make fun of something that you don't understand. Otherwise, you are in trouble with yourself. Now, the endocrine gland number six is connected with the solar plexus. And there we have our pancreas. In the solar plexus, we have many other organs also. But the pancreas is the main organ that also is interrelated in a powerful manner with the other endocrine glands, part of the endocrine system. It is a system, a magnificent system. What if we tell you that the pancreas is part of also of emotional intelligence? we could say an inferior emotional intelligence because the superior emotional intelligence was intuition. Feeling life, feeling life. And pancreas is also feeling life, but in an inferior manner. When you are nervous, don't you feel butterflies in your stomach, in your solar plexus? When you experience fear, when you are angry, don't you develop maybe a stomach ulcer? Or you experience acidity because something is wrong with your system. So this is a very sensitive instrument, the pancreas. And remember that illnesses like diabetes are connected with the pancreas, you know. So it's important to understand that we have to learn to transform negative emotions into positive emotions. Laughter, you know, instead of being sad or depressed, being able to laugh of ourselves. You know, positive emotion, like love. Love is the top of the top. The highest emotion of all emotions, instead of hatred. You see, this is why the seven deadly sins are affecting our pancreas. And we develop all kinds of illnesses, not only diabetes, also ulcers, psychosomatic illnesses. But do you know what is the superior sense connected with our pancreas? We said that before, isn't it? Telepathy. Many people believe that telepathy is coming from the brain. Well, there is a connection with the brain because all endocrine glands are part of the system. You know, through the hormones, through the hormones 
you know, we transmit energies through the entire human organism. So when we perceive something, we get a magnetic connection with another individual or with many individuals, and that suddenly we have a vision. We see things. is because we perceive through this magnetic organism, this magnetic organ called pancreas, we perceive the vibration, the emotional vibrations of other people. And then we send that fast at an incredible speed into our brain, and we translate that emotional perception into an intellectual perception, and it then it becomes thoughts translated into the particular language that we speak. There are hundreds of different languages in our world. Well, that's exactly what the brain is doing at this particular moment, the inferior intellect. So we said it before, how many times you visualize someone, you feel the presence of someone and the phone rings, somebody is calling you and then the person that you were visualizing, you know, is on the phone now and you said, come on, you know, I was just thinking in you. More than thinking, we were feeling and we translate that into thoughts. And the other person will say, yes, it happened to me also. Or we feel the presence of someone and we meet that person in the corner of a street. We're all both surprised. Well, we all have that potential. This is a telepathic connection. Today, according to many writers, you know, solar, uh, science fiction writers, many movies, apparently they say secret services, espionage, people who are into spying, you know, they are trained into telepathic, you know, activities. So when they steal a secret from the enemy, they transfer it telepathically to, to, to a center where the information will be accumulated, whatever, gathered. So maybe it sounds fantastic, incredible, but there is a tremendous percentage, percentage of reality learning to awaken our telepathic superior sense. Number seven, endocrine gland number seven, our genitals. If we are male, is our prostate. If we are female, the uterus. Did you know, did you know that when we develop, when we develop that specific endocrine gland, we can do incredible things. One of them is the so-called conscious astral projection. What is that? It means that we learn to control our astral body, our molecular body, and by doing that, we can even heal ourselves. Did you know, listen to this carefully, did you know that cancer is a molecular virus? If we learn to control our astral body, we can also heal the astral body because the astral body also gets sick when our sexual life is a disaster. You see, there is a strong connection. So we have, we said it before, we have to learn more and more and more about sexuality, about sexology. It's a field within science, within biology, and also within medicine. The trouble today in our so-called modern times, instead of learning to regenerate our sexual life, our genitals, which, are, which have also fallen into a stage of degeneration. So the common sexual education, instead of generating, degener or regenerating, we do the opposite. We have entered into a stage of complete degeneration. So people today are 40 or 50 years of age, and they already have a trouble with their own sexuality with their own sexual life. Why? Because we have entered into a stage of degeneration. When people uh, experience, you know, this kind of test called the counting the sperms, they can see that through the years, we have diminished in an incredible way the amount of sperms that we produce. Isn't that degeneration? Degeneration of an entire human race, because we know very little about sexuality. We need Viagra when we are 40 or 50. If you learn Gnostic anthropology with all respect, your sexual life will finish when we die. Because we know about true sexuality and true sexology, and we do recommend to those 
scientists who are also trying to develop their knowledge about this incredible field connected with endocrinology, they should study Kundalini Yoga, Tantra Yoga. Do we call it White Tantra? Because there is also Black Tantra. White Tantra, Kundalini Yoga, and also it is called in ancient by the, actually by the, you know, scientists that were persecuted by the Inquisition, the alchemist, they call it coitus reservatus. You know, there are many words for it. Sexual alchemy also, which is the way to regenerate our, you know, sexual life. Now, if you can learn to do, you know, this process of regeneration, as we said, you can awaken your capability to practice conscious astral projection. Your astral body can travel through the universe, visiting, you know, other parts of the universe or going to the most incredible hidden places of our own planet Earth and to study reality without being there. This is true imagination. This is clairvoyance. But it is connected with our genitalia, regenerating our genitals. So the seven endocrine glands as part of a system, a perfect system, organized system based on the seven musical notes, the law of organization of the universe. If we understand this better and better, we'll be able to awaken those superior senses and also awaken the superman, superwoman within. Fantastic, incredible. It, that, it, it looks like, it sounds like that, but we are searching for the truth. And really, we don't want to waste time and words speaking no, no sense. We're very respectful with the entire human race and very respectful with ourselves. So we need to share this kind of knowledge. To learn how to shut up the mind, this is an amazing process because we are so, nowadays we are so into constant thought all the time. Our youngsters are sent to school at extremely early ages and meditation is never, never taught. Walter Russell used to speak of a form of meditation, but he used different words. Walter Russell said to concentrate, which is thinking, and then decentrate. So his notion of decentration is no longer thinking. It's in other words, how often have we gone into a problem and tried to solve it? And then all of a sudden we would get so tired, we'd go to bed and the next morning we would have the answer. Well, you know, uh, we will have a special lecture in the near future about meditation techniques. You spoke of the solar plexus, the pancreas. You spoke of the emotions, negative emotions that are associated with that. And could it possibly be that in the process of healing, say you have diabetes or something like that, you said a lot of, well, all illness is related to the ego. So in the case of diabetes, what would you look for if you were meditating to try and find the ego there? Various negative emotions, right? Yes. Actually, the seven deadly sins are all emotions. Yeah. They are all negative emotions. So we have to transcend that by transforming that negativity into positive emotions and positive thinking also, positive thoughts. So we have to reinforce, you know, our, we have to transcend ourselves. We have to reinforce that perception that within ourselves, that is a superior nature. I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, uh, but if you are in a situation where Someone comes into your life. I, th I, th I think of driving, when you're driving your car, and someone is very hateful to you, leaning on the horn, very angry with you. The first thing you notice in your heart is hatred for that other person again. And so hatred breeds hatred, right? That's correct, yes. Yeah, it's essentially, you know, according to Gnostic anthropology and the new psychology and the new you know, the new anthropology and the new philosophy and the new biology, you know. So we say that life is a school of learning. So everything is a test. When somebody is insulting us, is insulting our intelligence, okay? Somebody is pushing us in the, on the road, you know, 
uh, horning you know behind us and trying to tell us to to get out of the way or whatever if we react listen to this and we are very angry and that angry anger will become hatred eventually when it grows and develops and sometimes we can even kill someone That's or right. we can have a heart attack based on our own reaction so we are convinced you know our s social perception of conduct is that when you are angry you are okay you know you're strong you know and it's very very common to listen to people say okay don't bother me because i'm going to get very very angry oh this man is strong you know it's the opposite when you are angry you are a coward you have a lot of fear fear is anger the ego is pure fear but you it's, see it's pretty hard for a gnostic person faced with that situation where someone's angry at you it's pretty hard to uh, basically do annihilation of the ego on the spot but you have to you have to annihilate you have to somehow find a way to destroy that and replace it with love it, it's the hardest thing to do is to replace hatred with love on the spot right yeah it's essentially you know because love is a very complex also perception of reality there are steps to get there first we have to observe ourselves 24 hours a day to discover how much ego we do carry within the seven deadly sins if if you remember that you had an explosion of anger today while you were on the road and how do you react maybe you insulted the other guy back or you show a finger maybe to the other guy or whatever you know how many cases happen that when people are carrying weapons in their cars and they're in the highway they start shooting at each other you know like mafia people you know sometimes they are even educated individuals who are not criminal but they behave like criminal by doing that because they cannot control themselves but also in in the process of meditation we are learning to shut up the mind observing ourselves okay remembering what we did during the day at night and then suddenly we realize that we were so weak instead of applauding ourselves like most of people would do oh i was so strong you know i told the guy to i show my power to the other person instead of uh, developing our own perception of our own behavior wrong beha behavior we should realize that we made a mistake we were so weak because it showed that anybody can manipulate us somebody is insulting us and we react with anger we become puppets and of it, other people. And it spoils your day. I, I have a friend, believe me, I'm no stranger to, to anger. I, I have a lot of anger in me still. But I have a friend of mine who gets angered very easily on the road. And you know what? If he has an incident with some other driver, for the rest of the day, he is totally down, totally into negative emotions. It, it really ruins the whole day for that person. And my, my question is, why do you want to let someone else control your emotions for the rest of the day? That's totally correct. Mm -hmm. You see, actually, this is extremely important. This is why Gnostic anthropology is teaching us a superior kind of psychology. How can we transform ourselves into the superman sleeping within, the superwoman sleeping within, a, a person without fear? Because when you have no fear, you will look at that person who is angry with compassion. Poor guy, he must have had a bad day. Also, he developed bad habits. He cannot change. Poor man, you know, he is in trouble. I'm not in trouble because I understand. You see, when we understand, this is an act of love. Love is not only hugging and kissing. Love is consciousness, is wisdom. So we have to awaken that wisdom within. And the opposite of the seven deadly sins are the seven virtues of the spirit. Instead of anger, should be what? Serenity and patience. Patience is coming from Latin paciencia. It means the science of peace. When you are at peace, you're strong. When you hate, you're weak. This is why people who jump into a battlefield in a war and they are full of hatred, they are weak. There are no winners. 
at the end of a war. No winners. Even if people say, oh, yeah, we won the war. Come on, you know. So much pain, so much suffering from both sides. We were really stupid. We were not intelligent at all. And this is something that has to be changed completely. Because there is a strong connection between psychology, parapsychology, and the seven superior senses and the seven endocrine glands. Because in reality, there are more than seven superior senses. What if I tell you, you don't have to believe me. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to be alert, pay attention. And the same way I respect everybody's point of view, I hope that you can accumulate this idea for the future. I have seen people levitating. I have seen it with my own eyes. And it wasn't an illusion. It was real. These people who learned to meditate did exactly what Jesus Christ did when he was walking in the ocean without touching the water, walking on the water. Do we all have that pos power, that possibility? Yes, we do. We all have it. If you can learn, if you can learn to, you see, to experience conscious astral projection, it means you learn to control aspects of your own organisms, your molecular universe within yourself, you can also learn to put your physical body into the fourth dimension. Then you can levitate and maybe you can even disappear, disappear and reappear somewhere else. Does it sound incredible, fantastic, crazy, idiotic? It does, but it is real. I have seen instructors in a, in a higher position within Gnosis, within Gnostic anthropology, who have developed that power. We all have it within. It doesn't happen overnight, but it is possible. You know, superior beings, angels, can do that. You know, many, maybe some evil people can also do something regarding that, but what they do, they develop the powers of the mind and they never annihilate the ego. These are the black magicians. When you want to learn Gnostic anthropology, you do the opposite. We don't develop the powers of the mind. We develop the powers of the soul. Soul means consciousness. Ego is unconscious, infraconscious, inferior than consciousness. So these superior senses have to be developed through our soul to do good things. We can heal people if we develop ourselves. You know, Jesus Christ, by just touching people, could do that. Moses did the same thing. All, you know, founders of different religions had this kind of power. What if we tell you that the founder of Gnostic anthropology, he could do the same thing. He could heal people by just touching them because he developed these superior senses, but also remember that we are made of fire and water. If you learn to transform that fire and water into light, how can we do that? Well, imagine, you know, the universe, we are a replica of the universe. We are also a replica of the planet Earth. When the sunlight is touching the ocean, the water will boil and will transform into clouds. And the clouds eventually will release electricity through lightning bolts. That's exactly what we can do within ourselves through the practice of Kundalini Yoga, Tantra Yoga, because if we learn how to move our own fire within ourselves, if we learn to concentrate the fire, the electricity of the body, and we make it ascend through the spine, 33 vertebrae, this is why number 33 is so important, we will be able to touch the seven endocrine glands, the seven churches of the apocalypse, because the body is a temple of the divinity and also a, a magnificent laboratory. So we can cure ourselves and we can also heal other people. And this is the tragedy of our entire human race today. You know, most of people are mechanical. We live a mechanical life. We stop being emotional because we never realize that emotion have nothing to do with being negative. We have to learn to develop positive emotions creative emotional feelings about reality instead of negative. And this is the problem of the ego. Nobody's teaching collectively to the entire human race to annihilate the ego. 
nobody or almost nobody. Our universities don't care about that. Our high schools don't care. Our schools for children or our kindergarten, they don't teach that. But we do it because we know a new civilization is coming, is going to be developed. This is the end of a cycle and a new beginning at the same time. So we have to learn to survive in the middle of so many conflicts, you know, wars, rumors of wars, and also Mother Nature is very much agitated. So something is happening already. And if we don't realize that, it means that we will continue sleeping 24 hours a day and we're never going to be awakened. Now, so how do we learn to shut up the mind, okay? If we haven't tried, you have to try it first. And after a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years, you will be able to concentrate into one point. You know, we do recommend to concentrate in our inner being because meditation means having a dialogue with the divinity. If you don't believe in the divinity, let's call it the genius within, the superman, superwoman sleeping within. Try to concentrate into that potential dialogue where we are going to be listening because it's not only asking, it's you stop thinking. You know, many schools of esoteric knowledge teach that this, the voice of silence is the voice of God, the voice of the divinity. When we listen to the voice of silence, we can establish a relationship with our own inner God within ourselves. Now, let's say if we cannot do it, we have tried for months and even years, and we cannot get there. Well, uh, ancient China, after the global catastrophe in Atlantis, you know, the survivors moved to what today is ancient Tibet or actual Tibet, ancient Ch or actual China, and also what today is the Gulf of Mexico. This is why the Mayans and the, the Tibetans have a similar language. The situation is at that time, people were very wise. The survivors became were very wise because this is why they survived. Mother Nature respected them. There were people who developed superior senses. Well, there was a technique to quiet the mind, to quiet the inferior mind. And it is called it is called the second jewel of the yellow dragon order. An ancient Chinese, you know, group of very spiritual individuals. They were also masters of the White Lodge. And it's important to understand that the inferior mind is not intelligent at all. It is called, in esoteric language, it is called the donkey. Listen to this. What's a donkey? It's an animal, very strong and very stubborn because it's controlled by the ego. The donkey is an egotistic animal. You know, you can talk to a horse, you can talk to the horse, and you love your horse, you hug your horse, and the horse will listen to you because he's intelligent. But you talk to a donkey, and the donkey will never obey you. Then you have to use a whip. Whip the donkey. Whip the inferior mind with creative willpower. Command your mind to obey. In the near future, we'll be giving you a lecture about also how to learn to quiet the mind, different meditation techniques. And this is really working. Learning to command the mind to obey you. Listen to this carefully. The inferior mind should never be your boss. Should never be our boss. The mind was given to us as a vehicle. The mind should be our slave. The mind should be our servant, never your boss. And the tragedy today is people say, oh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. It means I'm listening to my God. Come on, you know. You're listening to the ego, to the stupid donkey, a stubborn animal that is also wrong and it's not intelligent at all. And this is a tragedy for our modern times. We're so confused. You know, this is why we cannot learn to shut up the inferior mind. But in Gnostic anthropology, we learn that and we share that knowledge with the entire human race. 
I was watching the movie Amadeus, and that reminded me of what you said earlier in this lecture about composers like uh, Mozart. Mozart was depicted in the movie as being this laughing, uh, hideous type of person, but I doubt very much if he really was. I mean, the uh, writers of the movie took some literary license to make it more interesting, but what what is obvious in the mu in, in the in the movie is that Mozart wrote down all of his notes on a single piece of paper without copying them, and they were all originals. And Saliani, Seriani, or whatever his name was, looked at this music and was just absolutely blown away by the notion that um, there was no corrections, there was nothing made to alter them. He just Mozart just heard the music in his head. And he just, well, like a photocopy machine, was writing the notes down on a piece of paper without any corrections whatsoever. And it's absolutely amazing. And uh, Saliani uh, men mentioned that if you take one note away, it diminishes it. You know, it was just so perfect, right? Yeah, well, essentially, you know, in Gnostic Anthropology, we study all the geniuses of human history. And we don't want to be arrogant or selfish, but... Beethoven and Mozart, they were Gnostics, you know, geniuses that developed their superior sense, senses thanks to the knowledge of Gnostic anthropology. They were people who knew how to meditate. They could, they could have a relationship, a constant relationship, 24 hours a day, with the genius within, with God within, with the Holy Spirit and the Divine Mother of the Universe within. So this is why, you know, these people could really, and they eliminated the ego, of course, the subconscious, what blocks our intelligence, cosmic intelligence. So this individual, we could say they were angels reincarnated, people who were born with superior senses because they were performing, you know, before the courts, kings and queens at that time, when they were four, five, six years of age. They were born already with a lot of knowledge within. And of course, they continue developing those superior senses. So, is that possible for all of us to develop our potential, our sleeping human potential, up to a higher, higher level? Of course it is. We are here to do that, actually. And this is what is not, it's, it's extremely important for us to communicate with the entire human race to explain that this is a school where we tune with the purpose of life, which is awakening ourselves, our superior real being, to establish a relationship with our inner being and to give thanks to the universe, to Mother Nature, for giving us this opportunity to grow psychologically, spiritually, in every aspect. Because when we were born, we were incomplete. So we are here then to complete ourselves. So basically, you know, Beethoven and Mozart, you know, they were people who had that capability, that power. Yeah, but we all have um, attractions to different kinds of things within our life. I mean, we're all good at something. And I think we are anyway. And that's because in all probability, we did that kind of thing in a previous life, right? That's correct. Yeah, we all have talents and vocations in life, and it's important to discover that, you know. We all have an amazing potential, and that potential has to be awakened, has to be developed. Well, we have covered an awful lot of information in this uh, podcast. This is lecture number 13, and number 13 for a Gnostic is not a negative number. It's a positive number, isn't it? Yeah, well, according to the tarot, the ancient Egyptian tarot and Kabbalah, number 13 is death, death. You know, the mother of the universe, the feminine aspect of the divinity, she is called in esoteric language, divine mother love. Love means consciousness, means wisdom. But remember this, if we want to reach that wisdom, that capability of loving, that capability of awakening our consciousness, we have to annihilate the ego. 
and the ego is something which is bothering us. It wasn't given to us by the divinity. We created it because we were rebels against the divinity. We didn't respect cosmic law. We disobeyed the laws of the universe, and we created an animal psychology that becomes also evil eventually, evil psychology. So the death of the ego is extremely important. So the divine mother of the universe is love, is also death. She created physical death. Otherwise, you know, if we continue living here with this kind of negativity in the world, we would become worse and worse and worse. So when people die, especially negative people, well, there is a limitation for that evil to grow. What about the second death? The second death is explained in the Bible and many sacred books. You know, the second death happens in inferno. When we don't die in the ego here, Mother Nature will destroy the ego in the inferior dimensions of space and time, in the center of the earth. The liquid fire will purify the souls that go there to recycle. It's a process of recycling ourselves. So, but also there is a mystical death. Mystical death means annihilation of the ego here, 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 here. Annihilating the seven deadly sins to transform them into the seven virtues. We can awaken then a superior perception of reality, a positive and creative perception connected with our superior senses. When the ego dies, listen to this, when the ego dies, the superior senses will appear naturally because they, they've been always there. But they are atrophied because the ego is blocking our psychological growth. Please remember my words. You have been listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is lecture number 13. Thank you very much for downloading this podcast. I would like to mention several other websites. GnosticTeachings.org is a very good website with a tremendous amount of information. There are some other Gnostic lectures that we have done on RustyMicrophone.com. As a matter of fact, this entire series of podcasts was uh, born out of the first podcast that we did on that website. And we have continuing lectures of Gnostic Anthropology at RickyRadio.com. Email us at GnosticRadio.com at gmail.com.